So, ähm, guten Abend, meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren. Ich begrüße Sie zu unserer Ringvorlesung und I'm going on in English now. Uh, our topic tonight will be the biggest financial crash of the 18th century and we are fortunate to have the expert on the topic as our guest tonight. Um, Dr. Helen Paul is a lecturer in economics and economic history at the University of Southampton. She has uh, two master's degrees, one in economics and management from 1997 from Oxford and another one uh, in management, economics and politics from St. Andrews. Uh, she got her PhD at the University of St. Andrews in 2004 and she received an award uh, for this work. It was published under the title The South Sea Bubble, an Economic History of Its Origins and Consequences, London 2011. She had several teaching positions at St. Andrews and Southampton in economics and or economic history. Uh, she published a number of articles, all of them in the field of economic history and most of them on the early modern period. Uh, they are on different subjects. For instance, it's on gender, on the Navy, uh, on joint stock companies, and on slavery and slave trading. Um, she's also not only active as an uh, a researcher in academia, but also outside, so she's quite present in, uh, in the media. Um, she had some appearances on, on TV and in, uh, on radio, and she did uh, also historical work for schools. So we are uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank, thank you very much. much. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. I uh, hope to live up to all of that. Uh, and I apologize for having to say all of this in English, um, because obviously my German isn't very good. But I'm going to talk to you today about the South Sea bubble, which is a huge financial bubble of 1720 on the London stock market. So given that I, I read up on your, uh, your research training group about your interest in risk and how people conceive risk, I think the South Sea bubble is quite an interesting event because it's so badly understood at the time and it's been badly understood later and the idea of what the actual risks were how to interpret them that that is an interesting issue for debate so let me see what i'll do is i'll take us through a, a brief history of the bubble and the fact that it's often ascribed to a mysterious gambling mania or speculative fever uh, mania and fever clearly coming from this idea of some kind of physical or mental health problem. So you think often people move into these metaphors as if people have lost their minds, um, they're not thinking rationally, and of course if you're thinking about how someone assesses whether to make an investment or not, to say that they're completely irrational is a very strong statement. It's not one that economic historians themselves tend to agree with. So I will explain why later. But it is the predominant way of popular history and also a lot of non-economic history. It's a lot of mainstream history where they mention the bubble. They mention this idea of a gambling mania. And I'm going to talk to you about something about why that is. One of the great historians of the bubble is somebody called uh, P.G.M. Dixon. And he said, bear with me, he said that the 18th century was particularly risky, that that affected people's understanding of risk, that because it was so risky, they became quite fatalistic, so they were happy to take on more risk. Now, he, went, he didn't prove that in any way because, of course, the 18th century isn't obviously more risky than, say, the Middle Ages or, or indeed many other time periods. It's not obvious why having more risk around might make you take riskier decisions across the board, although there might be some idea that if you think you're going to die soon, you might 
live, live and be merry and go out and drink and enjoy yourself. It's not obvious that you'd run your business that way. So there are insights from what's called behavioural economics about how people really behave. And you can study that in a lab setting using similar sorts of experiments to the ones used by psychologists, putting people through their paces, asking them a series of questions, maybe giving them a game to play to see how they react to various states of the world, to various questions. I had a student who was interested in, in whether people became more altruistic when they'd been well-fed themselves. And she actually looked at people who were fasting through Ramadan and then after they'd eaten and found that there was a difference in their likelihood to, give, to be altruistic to others. This is a whole field that's fairly new-ish but hasn't somehow necessarily moved too far into the mainstream, although you see it sometimes through some popular books on economics. And I would say, of course, probably in, in line with what you say in your, your agenda, that you do have to look at people's attitudes through their actions. Because, of course, ex post, people completely revised their view of why they'd invested in the South Sea. Or they claimed that they hadn't invested in the South Sea at all when it turned out that it was decried as a bad thing. <clears throat> And of course, I think as well, there's been a tendency to think of people's attitudes to risk as if everyone's the same. There'll be individual dis differences. And also within the same individual, they'll have different attitudes at different time periods through their lives and with regard to different sorts of risk. And whether taking risk is acceptable or not is a socially constructed idea. <clears throat> it matters who you are as well as what you do when you make your investment decision or whatever it is. So I'll start with a little bit about what on earth is the South Sea. The South Sea Company itself was founded in 1711 <coughs> to deal with those very naval contractors that I'm interested in elsewhere. Why? Well, because the British government ran up a lot of debt. Um, so... That's, they couldn't pay their naval contractors who didn't want to continue supplying nails and ironware. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just going to clear my throat a second. And the like. And they'd been through this a few times, but now it was very, very serious. So what the company was formed to do was to then give naval contractors shares in this new company in exchange for the IOUs of the debts the government held. It was supposed to trade to the South Seas, which actually means South America. It doesn't mean the Pacific particularly. It means, in effect, going around the Caribbean area and down through um, the Atlantic side of South America. So the South Seas um, isn't where you might think it is. And the idea was that this company would eventually get the right to trade in slaves and some goods to the Spanish-held colonies in the Americas. Was this a crackpot scheme? Well, actually, Spain at this time was undergoing a problem of the war of the Spanish succession. The Habsburgs and the Bourbon families were fighting over Spain as to who should be the next king. And, of course, that made a difference to the balance of power in Europe. Now, out of all of that, Britain did come out on the right side, and they were able to get through the Treaty of Utrecht, or there were several treaties of Utrecht, but let's just say for argument's sake they're around 1713. When this ends, they get given various payoffs. And one of those is the Asiento contract. This originally goes to Queen Anne, but then she dies, and she's the last of the females, the last of the Stuart line that's Protestant. Um, there are some male Catholic stewards who pop up at various times to threaten the Hanoverian regime. Uh, and these, are, of course, are the kings that we imported from Hanover. George I, starting in 1714, his new regime as king. And that, of course, is important here because 
Later on, you'll see that the South Sea bubble only occurs a few years into George's reign, and it actually embroils at least one of his, several of his courtiers and one of his mistresses in, in the scandal. It's very important that this regime is retained because it's Protestant and because it's bound up with um, the, the national debt of which more later. If you got rid of these people and replaced them with the male Catholic line, that would be bad for the Protestant institutions, but it also would affect the paying off of debts because why would the Stuarts coming back in, why would they bother paying off any of the debts accrued under the previous system? So you had a lot of people with vested interests in keeping the regime going no matter what. And that's important when you think about are you going to invest in a company if it has state backing? If, the sense, if it's too big to fail, it might be sensible to invest in it. And the South Sea Company did have state backing, partly because it was part of what we might now call um, the fiscal military state of John Brewer's idea of the fiscal military state, that these companies were doing things for the government in terms of running their finances, but also doing various other things like international trade, which then led to more power, maybe also embroiled the, company, uh, the countries in war, and you've got this constant sense of um, a fighting between various European nations for territories, colonies, trading routes, and the like. You might think, well, maybe we should be in a cooperative equilibrium, maybe we should try to cooperate. But if there's no mechanism to get to that um, cooperative state, you end up with this constant competition. The South Sea did various things in terms of the national debt. It starts off by dealing with some of the naval debt, but it also continues to swap debt for equity. What that means is if you're holding on to a government debt, like, say, a payment called an annuity that pays out every year, that might not be very convenient to the government because it might be expensive for the government to keep paying you this. It might be bad for you because it's a certain kind of contract that you can't sell on very easily, so it's not very liquid. Why, no, why don't you take some company shares instead of this debt that you're holding? And maybe everyone will be better off. It's easier for the government, it's more flexible for them, it's more flexible for you. And although this is perhaps a little bit dry, this is the underpinnings of the founding of various famous companies like the Bank of England, and also the South Sea Company. And this swap has often been misunderstood in popular histories, but it actually had worked several times pretty well. When you come up to the bubble, they're doing it again, and they're also doing it on a bigger scale with more fanfare, offering various inducements to people to take, to buy shares directly, but also to swap the IOUs they have from the government for shares. And you end up with too many inexperienced people piling in, uh, and that's starting to push up prices. But other reasons why you might be interested in, these, in this company is because it has naval backing. It works with the Royal African Company as well. And the trade routes are starting to free up. Not only is this War of Spanish Succession ended, you're seeing the end of the Great Northern War that was affecting the Baltic trade routes. And that's going to affect shipping of any sort because Britain was reliant on various Baltic goods to keep their ships afloat. This all leads up into the bubble year of 1720. It's called the bubble year because before there's a bubble on the London market, there's obviously famously a bubble on the Paris market with the Mississippi bubble. And some of the reason for the inflation in London of share prices. Some of that's to do with an interest in the South Sea Company, but some of it is money coming in from France to avoid getting caught out in Paris. The reasons for the Paris bubble are somewhat different because there was a wholesale change of the way in which the French economy was run by the person in charge of it, John Law, and he completely altered everything. He started trying to create a monolithic, huge 
trading company, which we call the Mississippi Company. He wanted to issue the Europe, Europe's first official paper currency. He had some radical ideas which sound quite sensible today, but he didn't have the means to implement them properly. And money starts to flow out of Paris into London. When London's market gets overheated, the bubble bursts there, and money goes to Hamburg and Amsterdam, and there are mini bubbles in Amsterdam and Hamburg. But they don't seem to attract as much attention. So the fame of the Mississippi bubble and the fame of the South Sea attract attention to these episodes particularly, but not really to anywhere else. So the gambling mania argument, I've just really skimmed over some of the reasons that you might not believe in it. You don't need everyone to go gambling mad to have a boost in share prices across the market. Once you realize that some naive traders have come in and there's only a fixed supply of shares, if you buy in shares in order to sell out to these naive traders, then you become part of the inflation of the bubble. It doesn't mean that you have to yourself be irrational. You're riding the bubble. And that's what Peter Garber talks about when he insists that all of these bubbles are rational bubbles. That's what an economist calls a rational bubble, when you try to play uh, the naive traders. Larry Neal, whose work on the South Sea you can also look at, he talks about this contagion effect of money hopping from Paris to London to Hamburg to Amsterdam. But also, there's simply a difficulty pricing innovation in financial terms and also unusual events. So how do I decide how to price the future trading revenues of a company that may be very successful trading slaves to South America? And even, possibly, if the Spanish Empire collapses under its own weight, which it might have done, this is a potential first mover into a colony. So if I have a small stake in that colony and it wins big, it's like having a little lottery ticket and then hitting the jackpot. I can decide to venture some of my money into this scheme if I want to. And if I'm holding government debt, maybe it's just inconvenient for me to have something that isn't very liquid and a share would be handy and then I can sell it on. So there are various reasons why people might be interested in these shares. Whether it's rational or not to do so is that you have to think about your own attitude to risk. And I hammer this into my students' heads when I say to them, here's the tools you have for looking at a portfolio where all the information is known. Of course, in the real world, we don't know what's going to happen. So we give them a, a, an idea that with a bit of number crunching, they know the probability of recession, the probability of a boom. Uh, the payoffs if there's a recession, the payoffs if there's a boom. What can you work out from that? And they can work out the expected value of the portfolio. What they don't know is, is that portfolio something that the investor wants? Because they need to know the investor's attitude to risk, to know if it's rational for that person to invest. And of course, if you're only looking at one thing, how do you know what the rest of the portfolio is doing? And that could include houses, social networks, land, human capital, skills, goodness knows what. If you're only venturing a small amount of money, does it really matter if some part of your portfolio drops? And I think what we've discovered really is that the, the complaints about the South Sea bubble outweigh its real economic effects. So there's no real evidence of massive disaster. Yeah. There was a lot of evidence of people claiming there was a massive disaster, but no, not necessarily so. And there are people who've worked in great detail about trying to work out individual investors' shareholdings. It's easy to find people who complain because everything's gone wrong and they start having to write to people and explain their predicament. But again, you've got people for whom it all goes well who keep quite quiet about it. And this is a difficulty if you're trying to track people's actions because there's a selection bias in the material that exists. But it may interest you to know that Guy's Hospital in London was founded by Thomas Guy, who cannily bought these shares in the South Sea, not because they were booming, but before that, because he saw that the government was going to pay a set government fee to the company 
for its services in handling government debt. And he wanted that steady income for his charity. Of course, when prices shot up, he sold out at the top of the market. There were calls to redo everything, to send money back to its original owner. But when you go into a market, you ought to know that you're taking a risk. And it's a bit naive to claim that you suddenly don't want to be part of that world. Um, especially if you're then going to say that it's like gambling. Because if it's like gambling, you have to pay your gambling debts. You know that that's part of it. And this is a difficulty for us in understanding the difference between investment, problem gambling, and social gambling. How do we know where someone is on this diagram. Just because someone plays cards doesn't mean that they have a problem that they're a gambling addict. Even if they have a gambling problem, that doesn't mean that all their business decisions are taken as if they are gambles. We start to have a difficulty with uh, perhaps working out what gambling is and what investment is. And I think there are some issues where they do overlap and it's hard to tell that it's both a gamble and an investment. And I'll come on to that again at the end of this time. But PGM Dixon and various other people like the um, social historian Trevelyan have said that there was a culture of gambling in England in the 18th century, which therefore explains why you would have a sudden bubble on the financial market. Not to economic historians it doesn't, because why do you have a bubble occasionally if there's this constant gambling culture throughout? And what does that gambling culture consist of? Does it consist of people sitting around like in a Jane Austen novel, playing card games for small amounts of money or going to the horse racing, partly for social reasons and partly with an understanding that they might lose? So there's a theory that gambling particularly you have to face a loss in order for it to be entertaining and enjoyable. You're creating that sense of risk and danger, perhaps artificially, through the loss of money, the idea that you might lose money. And I would say that when you go into an investment proper at the top there, you're usually looking not to lose money. You're looking to somehow either keep things the way they are, maintain the status quo, or invest for the future. So are you doing it for precautionary means or for accumulation? Is it speculation? Is it gambling? And because of the um, economics definitions of these things are so precise, it can sometimes be a bit of a sterile discussion because the reason for very precise definitions is so that economists can use mathematics to do some sums. That doesn't mean that people in the real world necessarily... Um, are doing one or the other they might be doing both they might be thinking I enjoy investing but I see it as speculation but I don't want to lose it as a gamble I mean who's, you've got to look I think more at the cultural side of things but I don't think that you can claim that because there was some gambling in society and perhaps some problem gamblers that that's all about what's going on in the bubble <clears throat> and one of the things that's used to explain this alleged gambling mania is actually the area that people were trading in itself, and that's Exchange Alley. I'm just going to move away from the microphone and point at it. It is still there, and it's a shadow of its former self. It's just a little alleyway between very tall buildings in this strange shape all the little legs coming off it, wedged between the Royal Exchange at the top. And you can see Threadneedle Street there, there's the Bank of England. So it's wonderfully placed if you wanted to do share trading. It's open to everybody, tourists, servants, women, foreigners, anybody. And it moves away from what happened later, which is when stock markets became enclosed spaces for an elite group, male-only spaces, and then when they allowed women in, it was only women employees. We try to get in to, say, Lloyds of London today. There's all the security that stops you from getting in unless you've got a card and everything else. Here we have complete openness. <clears throat> you go there, there's brokers working out of coffee shops 
But what there also is in that hubbub are people who just happen to be going through Exchange Alley on their way from one street to the other, or who happen to be visiting the very shops that are in there. <coughs> there are people making wigs who sell in Exchange Alley. There are people who live some distance away who get someone to broker on their behalf through their bank. Or if you're a lady and you don't want to go into Exchange Alley itself because you're not, you don't consider that sufficiently ladylike, you can get your broker to come and visit you whilst you are in a nice ladylike shop that sells china or serves tea or something like that outside of that hubbub. So the share trading and the hubbub of the Exchange Alley are not necessarily the same thing. And even if you do sell shares with a lot of noise and um, bustle, that doesn't mean you're behaving irrationally. If you think about how people trade at cattle auctions, there's a lot of noise and movement going on, but it's not necessarily an irrational load of noise. And because women were shopping for shares in the way that they were shopping for China, it was easy to criticise them as being with an ad hominem argument, women are buying things like this as if they're buying trifles in the shops. It must be irrational. The stock market must not be any good because it's so open to people of this sort. And I don't think we would get away with those arguments today, but it explains some of the attitudes to the risk here taken by those particular people, in this case women, um, that they weren't allowed to be involved in the risk economy. They should know their place, because what would happen if they got any money out of the, their shares? Not good things. I think we can look at the idea of there being a gambling culture where people are insanely willing to take risks as being nonsensical when you realise the number of insurance policies and contracts to do with land and inheritance that people had. They were obviously husbanding their wealth. Um, so there's an element of risk aversion. For women, and I've used Women in Property by Amy Erickson as, as a starting point, there are various issues under the law which might make take buying shares a very sensible thing to do. The British used very badly spelled French, which is legal French. Uh, you'll notice that for some reason they've dropped the M in femme, um, femme covert and femme sole are people who are married women and single women. And if you're a married woman, your legal identity completely disappears on marriage. So you cannot sign a contract or be sued in your own name. There are lots of other things that can happen as well that might mean that your money and property and business go to your husband or to his creditors. You have various rules for widowhood, including dower and jointure, which decide how much money or property is going to be handed out to you on widowhood. But if you're not widowed and you're stuck with this man, you do get horrible instances of him disappearing for 10 years and then coming back and taking all your property legally. Unless you have a premarital settlement of some kind, <clears throat> you could have a separate estate, which is, keeps your money yours, but often you'd be given pin money, which is just a small amount of cash each year to buy ribbons and bits and bobs with. And you'd be allowed to keep your paraphernalia. That's what your husband and your creditors would realise was your property. And it could be things like clothing. Your husband could get rid of some of these things in lifetime, in his lifetime, but you got them all back at the end. So there's various rules about what you could be left with. Getting married is a risk. Not getting married is a risk yeah. at this time period because it's almost like how else are you going to put food on the table? But if you're married to the wrong man, something goes wrong if his creditors come upon you, it might be handy to have something, some wealth that is, can be hidden. And we know that women were share trading without their husband's knowledge through brokers. And often we've got a couple of cases of them trading through boyfriends rather than husbands. Which is interesting because, of course, it's a whole idea of a hidden economy that we don't know much about. And the reason we know about it is when things go wrong. 
We don't know much about when things go well. So we get people writing and saying, my lover so-and-so will not therefore help me with the share trading, but I can't do anything about it because, of course, I can't tell my husband. And Lady Mary Wortley Montague was in that category. Um, so that's what we know about her. But we don't know a lot about the people who just didn't leave stashes of letters. So the non-aristocratic people, there's not so much about them and their activities. The idea that people who shouldn't be in the markets were in the markets was a great song of social anxiety to the elite and to men particularly. We can see on the left-hand side, this is a famous picture by Hogarth of the South Sea bubble. It exaggerates the amount of damage done by comparing the South Sea to the Great Fire of London, in which it in no way had anything similar. You look at things like any, any uh, statistics we have for economic growth or bankruptcy, we can see no real sign as yet of a huge impact. But... Various people who thought they were going to be rich lost money, and you've got some people who lost a lot of money. So you get a lot of noise. And it does seem as if, well, the South Sea Company directors were caught taking bribes from some prominent people. So, of course, it was a political scandal. In the house on the left, you see all these women going up into this house to look for husbands. Down here, you have a pope and a Jew playing a gambling game. <clears throat> it's associating um, the idea of the stock market with gambling and with immorality and with the topsy-turviness of what can happen to the social order when you allow people to interfere. But it has absolutely nothing to tell us at all about the actual financial history of the South Sea, not anything. And as I often say to people, you can't see anything in here about the miseries of slavery. There's nothing to say about that. So for all their moralising, just bear that in mind. There's nothing that explains what the South Sea Company was actually doing, shipping thousands of slaves. And later, some historians claimed that they hadn't shipped anybody at all, and they actually had. The idea being that if the company wasn't interested in trade, why would you invest in it? This simplification then makes it even more difficult to explain why anyone would, would venture their money into this project. Now, I was talking about these playing cards earlier, actually, when we were having a chat beforehand, and there's a whole load of these, uh, which you can see online, the Harvard University. Um, I find them fascinating because they are clearly aimed at men who are Protestant Englishmen, who have come from the Church of England. Absolutely everyone else gets criticised. That's Irish and Scottish people, women... Women get a lot of complaint. Lots of cards that are anti-Semitic are against foreigners of various sorts. And the idea was that there was this anxiety about people coming into the stock market who knew things that perhaps the English landowner didn't understand and who might be willing to become rich at the expense of this English landowner. So we have here this very unpleasant card, which is all about ducking and a Jewish trader in a pond. It's still got this card logo on the top left-hand side. So you're criticising people at the stock market, presumably for their, quote, gambling mania, but you're using that pack of cards to gamble with. So it's a very strange set of things. And they've got a number of these sorts of cards, a number that appear around the time some of which um, come from the Dutch. And there's the Great Mirror of Folly. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's a great compendium of these sorts of things, much of it for the Dutch market. But this set is obviously in English, and it, there are only two cards that are, po uh, are positive at all. One is for a young man who's a wealthy landowner, and the other is for an older man who's a wealthy landowner. So I think we can see that... A lot of the commentary on the bubble comes from this elite group reasserting itself. It's not necessarily telling us much about the actual bubble. And there's a political performance because they go through a rigmarole headed by Robert Walpole of having an inquiry. 
The inquiry doesn't really explain to anybody exactly what went on, financially speaking, partly because the books have been allowed to leave the country. And the reason for that is that if you opened up those books, it would show exactly which people had taken bribes, including King George I's mistress. Now, remember, he had only recently become king with his new Hanoverian um, monarchy, and, of course, the Stuarts were waiting in the wings. They'd already tried to attack in 1715 and 1719, and they could easily come back if the Hanoverian regime weakened. So Robert Walpole had a huge attempt to get all of this cathartically out into the open, claim that he'd punished people, and then put a stop to it all, back to business as usual. And one of the people who came a cropper was John Aislaby, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and he was ceremoniously put in the Tower of London, which is the traditional home of traitors. But of course, by the time he'd gone in there, it was nothing like the Tower in the days of Anne Boleyn. Nobody was going to kill him or torture him. And he was allowed out not long afterwards. He was ranted at in, by politicians in public, but that was about it. And he eventually retired to his lovely estate at Studley Royal up in Yorkshire. And he started building fantastic gardens, which are still there, um, from monies arrived at who knows how, from his time as a chancellor. So I think we can see, it, you know, by this point, everything had died down, and there was no more questions. Some of the, the South Sea Company directors had money taken away from them and then given back again. So they had their estates confiscated and then part of it given back. And people knew about this, and they complained that Walpole was screening um, various individuals, and they called him the Screen Master General. So lots of these sorts of things appeared with screens on them. And lots of this sort of stuff as well. You don't, you don't necessarily have to read all the text because it's quite unfunny. It's just a whole load of stuff in Dutch about um, the stock market being a ridiculous place and people just trading in, as they say, wind. Notice the column, the figures. And then this is the same sort of thing, but you notice the image is reversed. And this was... Now in English, it's just an English copy of a Dutch satire. There's a huge market in this sort of thing, rolled out so quickly they didn't have time to make their own art. They just took, took Dutch art. And it's artists copying other artists. There's nothing in it really that explains much about financial history. So when we look at insights from economics, we might be looking at the idea that economists have about trade-offs, I might not necessarily be taking on a risk or not. I might be trading off one risk against each other. So if I put money under the bed, there's inflation risk. If I hold on to my government annuity, there's a risk that the, the government won't pay me. And if I try to sell it on, there's a liquidity risk. There's a risk preferences of the people concerned, which I've mentioned, and it's difficult to calculate probabilities. Even today, you get cases where people can't do simple sums. I'll mention a bit about behavioral finance, but again, revealed preferences, that's just a question of looking at what people do, not what they say they did. And the option, to have an option is valuable. It's worth paying money for an option, even if it doesn't play out. And sometimes that's not understood in the literature. I buy a share that entitles me to some government money and maybe gives me an option for more in terms of trading dividends. It might be worth it. And what I might care about as well is not just the risk I'm taking but what everyone else is doing because I want to be relatively wealthier than my neighbour. That's called the relative income hypothesis. So we look at exactly what's going on with people's attitudes, and we notice that there are very strange things in people's way of thinking about risk. They care much more about a loss than equivalent gain, and that's called the asymmetric loss function. Why would somebody, if they have a particular attitude to risk, why do they want to buy insurance and also lottery tickets? And the answer to that might be that they'll have a small amount on the lottery, but they'll insure larger amounts. That might explain why you'd be playing at cards one minute and then getting involved in very complicated legal 
deeds and trusts to protect the main bulk of your estate. Um, if you want to know where that all comes from, it's come from the work of Kahneman and Tversky. That's a diagram of what it looks like. It's different people have different versions of this. But usually, if I lose $50 or 50 euros or whatever, and the same day I gain 50 euros, I actually still feel worse off. That's not necessarily, I say, well, that's irrational, but still there's this loss aversion that seems to be bred into our, uh, our ways of thinking. And maybe there's an evolutionary reason for that. Maybe we sensibly care a lot about avoiding loss. But it would explain why someone who's lost perhaps a relatively small sum of money complains bitterly about it. Also, it might explain as well, because at the time of the bubble, people were told that maybe winners would have to give the money back to losers. So you had an incentive to complain bitterly if you'd lost money and say nothing if you'd gained it. And I think that there's in this a bit of a, a Whig history, uh, the idea of a stage-by-stage -stage model of a, an inevitable progress where people somehow know how to calculate risk. I think this is that in the past they didn't and now they did and they were in a better place. I think this is nonsensical really because throughout history we've seen that people have tried to mitigate risk, to calculate risk, but also we've seen that people some have sometimes been risk loving and risk averse and that that is more um, it's more about cherry picking which bit of the past you're going to look at when you look at um, how people deal with risk. How am I doing for time? Still 10 minutes. Okay, I, I was a, a, bit <laughs> a bit unclear. So I think this idea of the, the, the notion that you're moving into the modern world, modernity, with insurance companies being able to calculate risk more accurately is only really of interest if you're only talking about insurance companies themselves. If you're talking about the general public's attitude to risk, I don't think that there's a stage-by-stage -stage model of progress there. You can see in the South Sea Bubble time period people trying to think about diversifying their portfolios and trying to think about how to avoid various risks, say, of being left behind their neighbours or dealing with a, a broken down marriage or whatever it is. When it perhaps makes better telling to claim that they, were, they all simply went gambling mad and, and sought out risk. I don't think that that's necessarily the case. There might be one or two individuals who had gambling problems who then went into the stock market, but a lot of people didn't think like that. And you can see that from letters, they're looking to invest to maybe just eke out their standard of living or maybe move up the social scale a little bit. Um, I mentioned Lawrence Stone's effect of individualism just as another sort of weak history, so I'll just skip off with that. In a book that I found very interesting about thinking about this notion of how can you tell this is an investment, can you tell this is risk aversion or are people risk loving, is Betting on Lives by Geoffrey Clark, which is about the early insurance industry people would buy life insurance sometimes for very reasons of risk aversion. Obviously, if someone died, you want to be compensated. And that could be someone you didn't know because you would be trading, perhaps, with that individual. Or maybe it might be a, a key public figure. And if that person died, it would affect maybe the trading routes. So there are various key business reasons why you might want that facility. But you could also find people buying life insurance on friends and neighbours or public figures as a form of gambling and risk-loving behaviour. It was very difficult to disentangle these two motivations from looking at someone buying a policy. So insuring the lives of key figures doesn't really tell you whether that's someone who's risk-averse insuring against a trading route problem or whether they're gambling on whether you know, king somebody or another might die just because they are entertained by that prospect. That made me think that, as well, with the South Sea, you can't really necessarily tell what people are doing 
because you've got to take into account various issues with, within insurance. Um, these are economic terms, moral hazard, adverse selection, asymmetrical information. People's behavior changes once you give them a contract, that's moral hazard. Adverse selection, you might be able to draw in the wrong people to your contract. Uh, and asymmetrical information, they may know more than you do. So those are the underpinning problems with insurance that you'd also have to take on, on top. With the South Sea, a share in the South Sea, if you were swapping that government annuity for a share, the government annuity, just because of the law of contract, was very difficult to pass on to someone else. So your share might be more liquid. It's not correct to just look at what the money might be from your annuity and what the money might be from your share without taking that link liquidity premium into account. And also, you've now got a company speaking for you as its representative to force the government to keep paying. And also, if you're thinking about large numbers of annuity holders, they didn't have that power. So the government quite happily went into arrears and didn't pay them on time. With one major company, that's more difficult. The government pays this fee to the company, and that also deals with a lot of red tape costs as well. It's easier to do that. And then you can decide to sell on your share as you want. The government fee is more or less guaranteed. It's low risk. But then you also get potential profits from the slave trade, which are higher risk, but maybe higher return, and a very small chance that you might get a colony. So you can see within that one share, you've got a bit of in inbuilt portfolio diversification already. I've got the bit that's risk-free, the bit that's medium risk, medium return, and the bit that's high risk, high return, all packaged into the one share. Therefore, why does someone buy that share? Which bit of it are they interested in? Unless you can track maybe through letter writing or looking at the rest of their portfolio, it's very difficult to know why that would be. It's certainly not reasonable to say that they all went gambling mad. Um, so... I think, uh, oh, there's one last bit. The Great Mirror of Folly that I mentioned, there's a very good book on it out, which is a, quite an expensive, great big hardback book called The Great Mirror of Folly by Labio et al. Eds. And <clears throat> reading through that, all of these criticisms of people at the time of the bubble, in the bubble year, going back and back to how much folly there was, what they were criticising was, A, the South American trade, which they felt was ludicrous, and it turns out to be lucrative. And also insurance through joint, joint stock companies, which again turn out to be very successful things. And I think that's an indication of how, how much the propaganda of the time is out of step with what actually happens in the economy later on. So I think I'll stop there. That's, is that right? <laughs> okay. Hi. Thank you.